Hello and welcome back to my channel, What If Deku Tuo. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part 3 of our series, What If Deku Was In Class B And Had Harim. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Alpha of Rapture from FanfictionNet. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now let's dive into the fanfic. Just outside the downpour zone, the Kami, Tetsutesu, Jiroda, and Izuku continuously exited the downpour zone just in case some villains were waiting in ambush. Once it was clear that no villains were laying in wait for them, they stealthily moved toward the plaza. They watched from their hiding spot as Vlad Sensei did battle with the hand villain. They all froze in fear when the handy villain disintegrated part of Vlad's arms. The situation only worsened when Namu started to fight Vlad. They watched as their teacher clashed with Namu, serving the beast's limbs only for them to regrow. Izuku did his best to remain calm and objective just like Nezu had told him to do. With a deep breath, Izuku calmed himself and paid close attention to the fight, taking note of every detail he could. He soaked up as much information as he could as it could prove pivotal if he needed to come up with a way to beat the villains if his teacher failed. As if his thought made it so he watched as his teacher was defeated and pinned to the floor. Izuku powered up one for all at 5%, tapping into that ball of lighting that sat in his chest. Green lightning arced down his arms and seemed to gather in his hands as he watched. Izuku was ready to jump in and save his teacher. But he paused when Kirijiri arrived and reported to Tamura. Hope flared in him when Kirijiri said that Juzo had escaped. It was only a matter of time till help arrived now. The hope flared brighter when Tamura said he would just leave. But then Tamura turned to look at someone. Izuku following the villain's gaze spotted his friends. Izuku blinked and Tamura was suddenly in front of them, his hands reaching toward Yanagi and Kanoko. Izuku recalled Tamura turning Vlad's forearm and shield to dust. The image of these girls turning to dust flashed before Izuku's mind. The thought caused rage and emotion Izuku normally had buried deep within himself to come roaring out from the depths like a sea monster. Izuku jumped out of their hiding spot out into the open. Fist cocked back and lighting coating his arm all the way up to his shoulder. Don't touch them, Tesla smash! bellowed out Izuku as he threw his punch forward. A bolt of green lightning shot out of his fist. Thunder echoed throughout the usty and a burst of wind burst forth from his punch. The bolt struck Tamura before he could react. The villain was engulfed in light for a moment and Tamura was flung away from the girls, his clothes smoking and scorched. Tamura, yelled Kirijiri in some concern. Grab Sensei, ordered Izuku before he dashed to place himself between the villains and his teacher. Izuku threw a much smaller but no less fast lighting bolt at Kirijiri, which struck the mist villain in the armor around his neck. The mist villain screamed in pain as the bolt connected. Namu rushed to Tamura's side, placing himself between his master and Izuku. The villain's body twitched sporadically due to the electricity and he was also sporting electrical burns. He glared in hate as he watched the student regroup around the rabbit brat. Izu, since when could you do that? questioned Pony as she helped Kanoko over. The students rallied around their fallen teacher. Later, Jirota grabbed Sensei, Manga grabbed Kinko. Started Izuku but was interrupted by Tamura. Smash, huh? You must be a fan of All Might. Do you think he'd approve of you trying to kill me? That's not very hero-like, but that won't matter for long. Spoke Tamira hatred in his voice as he fully stood up with some help from Kirafiri. Namu kill the brats, ordered Tamira coldly. Namu rushed forward appearing in front of Kami, first raised to kill the girl. Kami's eyes widening at Namu's sudden appearance. I said you won't touch them, smash! yelled Izuku as he punched Namu in the face accidentally using 100% of one for all. Kami would swear later that she saw the following in slow motion. Izuku's fist made contact with Namu's beak, which carved it in at the impact. 
The birdman was sent flying away, its neck clearly broken as it bounced off the concrete floors a few times before coming to a stop. Both the heroes and villains were in shock at the events. What I used 100%, but I didn't break myself, thought Izuku, before Tamura grew a demented smile. You really are very powerful, aren't you? To be able to do that to Namu despite his shock absorption and regeneration quirks. You might be a nice warm-up before he kills All Might. Namu, forget about the other brats. Kill the rabbit and make sure it's painful. This is top priority, ordered Tamura excitedly. Namu stood his neck already healed. The genetic abomination charges forward toward Izuku. Run, get the others to safety, spoke Izuku to his friends as he dodged Namu's first punch which caused a crater to form on the concrete floor. His comrades hesitated not sure what to do. Kami was the first to take action. Izuku catch, yelled Kami tossing Izuku one of her last gas grenades to him. Izuku caught the gadget with little issue. Kami hoped it would be useful as she grabbed the injured Kinko from Yanagi and started making her way to the entrance. Jiroda and Manga carefully picked up Vlad King and followed Kami toward the main entrance. Tetsu Tetsu did not want to run as that was not manly, but if the others ran into more villains, they'd be vulnerable while carrying the injured. It would also not be manly to leave them undefended. Go. We'll help Izuku. Once the injured are safe you can come back, spoke Yanagi as she laid a hand on Tetsutetsu's shoulder. All right, I'll be right back, replied Tetsutetsu, deciding to trust in his classmates. The metal hero moved to catch up with the group heading to the entrance, he would make sure they got there safely, then he'd come back with more classmates to help. Yanagi and Pony stood side by side, watching as Izuku dodged and weaved around Namu's attacks. It was like watching someone try to hit a fly. The only difference was that each missed attack shattered concrete and stone. Izuku was using all his agility to avoid taking a hit and unbeknownst to them, he was using 8% full cowl in bursts to avoid the monster's attacks. Unfortunately, Namu was sticking close to Izuku in its pursuit to kill him. This made it hard for Yanagi and Pony to support him with ranged firepower. We can keep those two occupied so they don't interfere. Spoke Yanagi looking at Tamura and Kirijiri. The two villains seemed to be paying more attention to Izuku's fight with Namu than to them. Both heroines knew that the moment it looked like Izuku had the upper hand that the villains would interfere. I can take the mist man. If he tries to portal my horns, I can just change their direction. Spoke Pony knowing that her ability to control her horns' movements would be effective against the warping villain. Yanagi nodded, accepting Pony's proposal. He seems to have some sort of armored collar. It may be a vulnerability and be cautious he may attempt to warp you away. Spoke Yanagi pointing out the metal collar. Their plan made, the two heroines jumped into action. Pony fired a bunch of her horns and Yanagi had plenty of broken concrete at her disposal. The projectiles flew at great speed toward their prospective targets. The villains spotted the attacks and were forced to dodge out of the way. The bits of concrete sailed past missing Tamira, but the horns simply turned to follow Kirijiri. The warper opened a portal in front of the projectiles to try and redirect them back at Pony. The horns flew through the portal, but once on the other side, they turned 90 degrees, and now two separate groups were coming for the warper from opposite directions. Kirijiri once again tried to redirect the horns only for them to split into four groups. How troublesome! spoke Kirijiri as he continued to try to avoid the attack. Tomorrow was also having trouble not only was he still injured from his bout with Vlad King and Izuku's attack, but Yanagi was throwing small rubble at him, which the villain found to be incredibly annoying as he couldn't simply disintegrate the small projectiles. Tomura ran toward the ghost girl trying to get closer so he could dust her. But once he was within her quirk's range, she simply reached out with her quirk and took hold of one of his legs, forcing him to trip. Tamura gritted his teeth in pain as he fell face first into the floor. He immediately moved and dodged another barrage of rubble and stone. Yanagi had already backed away from him, determined to keep him far out of arm's reach. 
but she also remained on guard in case Kirijiri attempted to assist his boss. Izuku took a look seeing Yanagi and Pony fighting the other two villains. He was worried about them. But he was happy to see that they were holding their own for the time being. Izuku's distraction cost him as Namu was able to land a blow Izuku was sent flying back. Izuku crashed through one of the nearby trees, sending splitters in every direction. Pony and Yanagi were worried when they saw Izuku take the hit, but they forced to refocus on the villains who tried to take advantage of their lost focus. Izuku stumbled to his feet picking up Kami's grenade as he rose to his feet. He was lucky that one for all boosted his defenses or that punch could have killed him. But Izuku was not unscathed, his left arm hung limply at his side clearly broken. Namu, seeing his target was still standing, started marching toward Izuku. Focus Izuku, I can help them, after I deal with Namu. But how do I beat him? Even if I can hit him with 100%, he just regenerates any damage I do, and I can't take another hit like that. What if I don't beat him? What if I just take him out of the fight, thought Izuku as he ran through possible solutions using what information he had. Izuku's eyes darted to the ceiling above and then landed on Namu. That could work, but I'll need to slow Namu down. If I use Kami's glamour grenade it should make him stand still long enough for me to get rid of him. I'll have to thank her later, thought Izuku, his one good hand clenching the grenade Kami had tossed to him earlier. Cue Izuku's hero music Izuku dashed back into the plaza, making it look like he was going toward Tamira, and Namu moved to intercept the green-haired hero student. Once Namu was in the right position, Izuku jumped back from Namu, tossing the now-primed grenade in between them. Namu, not being a smart creature, simply chased after his target, not even glancing at the grenade as he collided with it. The grenade released Kami's multicolored glamour gas. Namu stopped in his tracks confused as to where his target was and why there were six masters. Namu simply stood there in confusion, unable to complete its priority order. What did you do to Namu? yelled out Tamura as he charged at Izuku. Only for Yanagi to trip the villain again. Izuku didn't respond to the villain as he dashed back toward Namu, ducking low once he was close enough. The following events went by so fast that those present could barely keep up. Huston smash, called Izuku as he used 100% to sweep Namu's legs so fast that Namu seemed to hover in mid-air for a moment. The strike also shattered the monster's legs. Cape Canaveral smash, yelled Izuku as he performed a rising uppercut, at 100% sending Namu flying upward. Izuku brought full cowl to 8% and jumped after Namu. Those near the entrance and the plaza watched as Izuku rapidly ascended toward Namu. Namu tumbled in midair still under the effects of the hallucinations of Kami's quirk. Namu reached the apex of his flight almost touching the usty ceiling and was now falling back down to earth only for Izuku to rapidly get closer. Apollo smash, yelled out Izuku. Izuku threw a full power kick at Namu green lighting trailing his leg. The blow caused Namu's chest to buckled and collapsed inward. Once again the rumble of thunder and intense wind accompanied the blow. The anti-symbol of peace was sent upward at great speed. Namu's body punched right through the Ustis metal ceiling without even slowing down causing the sound of tearing metal to echo throughout the facility. Namu quickly vanished from sight, the dispersing of clouds indicating that the monster was still going. That cheater, Kurajiri we have to gank the brat now, yelled out Tamura in hate as the villain plunged his hands into a small portal that Kurajiri made. Izuku watched with some pride and satisfaction as Namu was sent flying. But he wasn't done, he still needed to land and help deal with the remaining villains. However, a portal appeared just a little below him, the bloody and burned hands of Tamura reaching through the dark mist. Izuku didn't have time to dodge, he was going to fall right into those hands and be turned to dust. Don't worry kid, I got you, spoke the feminine voice from his dream. Izuku noticed that he just suddenly stopped falling, he was just floating there for a breath, looking at the hands that were just out of reach. Don't just stare, let him have it, spoke the female voice in his mind again. The voice figuratively kicked him into action. 
Izuku threw a 5% Tesla smash, the bolt arced through the portal and hit his foe directly. The wind generated from the punch had the added benefit of knocking him away from the portal. Izuku was sent flying away from the plaza and toward the mudslide zone. But he was caught by someone despite him still being high above the floor. A pair of arms wrapped around him and his head was resting against a familiar softness. Earlier in the landslide zone, Deep in the landslide zone, Kendo deflected a villain's jab and retaliated with a palm strike to his chest, enlarging her hand at the last moment. The villain went tumbling back sliding down the muddy terrain. Kendo was covered in mud but seemed uninjured for the most part. Three more villains took the last one's place and quickly attacked her. There's no end to them. How are you doing Satsuna? asked Itsuka before she rolled out of the way of a torrent of water from a villain with a water tank on his back. Kendo enlarges her hands during her roll, letting her do a handspring kick right into the villain. Kendo landed on her feet after her attack. The villain on the other hand was on the ground out cold. Fine, these guys aren't so tough, responded Setsuna as she roundhouses kicked a skeletal-looking villain in the face. She had barely needed to use her quirk so far. I'll show you tough you little brat, yelled a villain, who breathed a torrent of fire at Satsuna and Kendo, not caring if he hit his fellow villains. The two heroines ran ducking and weaving past the villains before they dove behind some partly buried buildings just as the flames were licking at their heels. They heard a combination of screams and swearing as several villains got caught in the attack. The torrent of fire ceased and the two heroines peek around their cover. What the hell man, don't fry us too, bellowed a bull-like villain as he slapped some wet mud on top of his burning sleeve. Shut up, I'll keep them pinned, you guys flank them, or I'll barbecue you, responded the fire-breathing villain. He took a deep breath, his chest distending far past what was normal. Satsuna and Kendo both ducked down behind their cover as more fire slammed into the remains of the building. Okay, I'll admit they're a bit tougher than I first thought, joked Satsuna trying to reveal some tension. Not the time, Satsuna. How about you help me figure out a way to deal with these villains? We have to get out of here and find Izuku and the others, spoke Kendo seriously. Satsuna nodded, but couldn't resist the opportunity to tease her classmate. Okay, you win, but you seem awfully concerned about Izuku to me spoke Setsuna breaking out into a teasing grin. Kendo's domino mask did little to hide the blush on her face. Of course I'm concerned. He breaks himself when he uses his quirk, remember? If he was sent somewhere by himself, what do you think would happen? spoke Kendo glaring at Setsuna. An image of her shy, fun-to-tease classmate popped into Setsuna's mind. His costume in tatters covered in blood. His body was broken and slumped against a wall. His eyes were full of fear and defiance as shadowy villains closed. The mental image caused her face to pale and her heart to tighten. Her eyes narrowed and her face grew serious. We got you, yelled out a thin flying bird villain with a staff and a near-naked albino villainess with long claw-like nails in unison. Kendo used one enlarged hand to catch the bird villain's weapon midswing and swatted him like a bug with the other, sending the villain careening into the bull villain from earlier. The clawed villainess slashed at Satsuna, but the villainess's claws hit nothing but air as Satsuna separated her torso into pieces. What? shouted the villainess in surprise. Satsuna used the momentary distraction to flip the villainess over her shoulder. The villainess fell face first into the mud and her momentum caused her to slide downhill. The villainess crashed into several of her allies, making them fall like bowling pins. This gave Satsuna an idea. Come on, let's go, spoke Satsuna as she pulled Kendo to follow her up the muddy sloop. Where are we going? questioned Kendo as she glanced back at the villains. She counted thirteen villains of various sizes chasing after them. I got a plan, this mountainside was made to be unstable, so you're gonna bring the whole thing down on top of them," spoke Setsuna, a confident smile on her face. Kendo matched Setsuna's smile with one of her own. The two athletic teen girls easily outpaced the villains, who yelled obscenities and threats at the two as the gap between them grew larger. 
Setsuna saw the large wall that marked the edge of the landslide zone as they neared the top of the artificial mountain. They got nowhere left to run, we got them now, yelled out one of the villains in glee. This should be good, let them have it, spoke Setsuna as she slid to a stop. Kendo stopped downhill of her reptilian-dressed comrade and enlarged her hands to their maximum size. Kendo started to punch and slap the ground trying to cause a mudslide. The villains seemed confused at Kendo's actions, but they just kept charging up the hill at them. Come on, yelled Kendo in frustration as she slammed both her massive fists into the muddy ground. Some of the relatively smarter villains finally realized what she was up to and turned tail and started running downhill. But it was too late. It started with some of the debris shifting ever so slightly, and then the entire mountainside collapsed and started flowing downhill rapidly. Some of the villains didn't even have a chance to scream before they were swept away by the mudslide. Kendo would have also been swept away if not for Setsuna. She had detached her torse and grabbed Kendo and floated the two over to the stable ground. Setsuna let Kendo down and reattached her torso with her lower body. Kendo spat out a month full of mud and took several deep breaths. Way to go Kendo, I knew you could do it, spoke Setsuna slapping Kendo's back. The redhead gave Setsuna a thumbs up. All right, let's go find our class rabbit, commented Setsuna, hiding her worry with her normal playful attitude. But before the two could start down the hill, a big burly villain burst out of the ground grabbing Setsuna as he emerged and knocking Kendo away. He held the reptile girl over his head in a vice grip. Man, you too sure gave those losers some trouble, spoke the villain in a mocking tone. Kendo stood enlarging her hands to attack. Electricity raced up the villain's body electrocuting Setsuna for a moment. Kendo stopped in her tracks when Setsuna started to scream in pain. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you try anything and your friend gets it. Threatened the villain letting some more electricity arc over his arms for emphasis. What do you want? asked Kendo glaring at the villain as she tried to come up with a solution. The villain looked Kendo up and down and smirked. Well, I was going to have you surrender, but on second thought you don't look half bad. So I'll be nice and make you a deal, you strip down and give me a little show, and I'll let you and your friend go. My job was just to shut down the security, so I get paid whether you two live through this or not. Offered the villain giving her a smile worthy of a veteran used car salesman. Kendo looked disgusted. She did not want the first guy to see her naked to be this creep, and she did not think for a second that he'd keep his word. There is no way I want this guy to be the first to see me naked, if I'm going to show anyone then, thought Kendo as the image of a blushing speechless Izuku came to the forefront of her mind. Her thoughts were broken when she heard Satsuna whisper in her ear, Play along, when I give you the signal let him have it, whispered Sestuna's disembodied lips. Kendo glanced up at her classmate and had to resist smirking. She looked back at the villain doubling down on her glare. Fine, spoke Kendo through her teeth. She shrunk her hands back down to normal size and took a few calculated steps forward. The villain told her to stop approaching, but she didn't mind. She was close enough for what she wanted. Kendo proceeded to stand their glaring daggers at the villain. The villain grew agitated when Kendo continued to do nothing. Come on get started already girly, or do you want me to fry my hostage? Bellowed the villain wanting her to strip already. Unaware of Sitsuna giving Kendo the signal. What hostage? Questioned Kendo knowingly. The villain brought down his hands but was confused when all he was holding was a leg and part of a torso. Looking for me? Spoke Setsuna with a whistle. The villain looked up only to get mud and dirt slammed right into his open eyes. Aw, oh, my eyes, yelled the villain as he started rubbing his eyes dropping Setsuna's parts which flew out of reach. Kendo took the opportunity to run toward the villain. Kendo then slipped into a perfect forward split with ease and threw a punch with an enlarged fist. It was a nut punch that would make Johnny Cage himself nod in approval. The villain let out a high-pitched cry and then proceeded to keel over, foam coming out of his mouth and his eyes rolled back into his head. Kendo rose from her split, still in a fighting stance. That's what you get, 
yelled Satsuna as she reassembled herself besides Kendo, her hair sticking out in multiple directions. You okay? asked Kendo, concerned about her friend. Besides needing to fix my hair. Yeah, I'm goo, started Setsuna before a bright green flash of light and the sound of thunder grabs their attention. A torrent of wind followed soon after, which forced them to shield their eyes. The wind shattered the dead light bulbs around the edges of the Usji. The two girls only knew one person in class who could generate wind like that. Come on, we should hurry, spoke Setsuna. Kendo nodded in agreement, and the two moved to leave the mudslide zone and head toward the plaza. Another torrent of wind swept through the Usti accompanied by the sound of something shattering concrete. After Kendo and Sestuna made it out of the landslide zone, another burst of wind swept over them. The two girls picked up the pace as two more massive bursts of wind came from the plaza forcing them to slow down. The sound of tearing metal echoing throughout the facility caused them to stop and look up. A massive hole had been created in the Asti ceiling. Another smaller burst of air and flash of green came from above, and they soon spotted a familiar green-haired hero falling toward the landslide zone. Itsuka, throw me, demanded Setsuna. Kendo enlarged a hand and picked the girl up by the stomach, holding her in a similar fashion one might hold a javelin. Kendo took a moment to properly aim at her target. She took two steps forward and then hucked Setsuna into the air. The wind flew past her face as she moved through the air. Sestusna separated her body into pieces so she could control her accent. She grunted in some pain when Izuku collided with her. But she quickly wrapped her arms around him and allowed herself to fly back to lessen the impact. Once she had control over their flight she moved back toward Kendo. Internally she was relieved that Izuku was okay. She glanced at the massive hole that was torn in the ceiling. Holy cow, sometimes I forget how much power you have in this cute little package, commented Setsuna, as she readjusts her arms to get a better grip on him. She also took the opportunity to pull Izuku a little more into her breasts. She wanted to mess with him a little for worrying her, even if he wasn't aware of it. Setsuna, I'm glad you're all right and thank you for catching me, spoke Izuku as he looked back at her. But he wasn't blushing or stuttering he was so serious and sincere in his words that it actually made Setsuna blush in surprise as she floated them back down to the ground. Good catch, Setsuna. Izuku, are you all right? asked Kendo who rushed over to them once they were on the ground and started looking over Izuku. She immediately determined that his left arm was shattered on top of a lot of other smaller injuries that littered his body. No time, we have to get back to the plaza right now, replied Izuku as he started running back toward the plaza. The two girls were surprised when Izuku started moving so fast and they struggled to keep up with him. Izuku grunted in pain due to his broken left arm. He also must have smaller damage from having to use 8% to prevent Namu from flattening him. Come on, Izuku, just hold on a little bit longer. All Might and the other teachers should be here soon, thought Izuku as he re-entered the plaza. Izu, you're back, spoke Pony happily in English. There were more villains in the plaza. It would seem some of the stragglers from the different zones had rallied around Tamira. Guys, I'm back yelled Tetsu Tetsu as he and some of their classmates entered the plaza. The students rallied behind Izuku and Kendo, ready to buy more time for the teachers to arrive. Izuku took stock of who he had at his disposal. Besides Kendo, Satsuna, Pony, and Yanagi who were already in the plaza. Kamakiri, Kami, Jirota, and Bondo had come with Tetsu Tetsu from the entrance to help. The rest of the class were probably either with the injured at the entrance or still isolated somewhere in the facility. Pony, Kami, Bando, and Tetsu Tetsu, you guys deal with the warper, try and incapacitate him if you can, he's their only escape route. Yanagi, you're with me, we are going for the leader, just focus on his hands, if you can keep him from being able to touch me then I should be able to knock him out. The rest of you are with Kendo and you're dealing with the other villains. Work together, watch each other's back. We can win this, spoke Izuku giving out the battle plan as full cowl flared around him. Are you certain you are able enough for battle? You are heavily injured? Asked Yanagi in clear concern as she made note of his injuries. 
she has a point you also look like you're about to collapse. You should go back to the entrance let us handle this. Spoke Kendo not wanting him to push himself while so injured. But the look on his face clearly indicated to all present that he wasn't going to leave them. Izu you're hurt, please at least stay back you can lead better that way and you can help with your lightning attacks. Spoke Pony in English trying to convince him. Izuku's resistance quickly crumbled. But Tamura once more interrupted them. What the hell is with you brats? You should have just been low-level mobs that were supposed to die by our raid party before the boss fight started. Not only is one of you using hacks, but the rest of you brats are annoying gimmick mobs, ranted Tamira as he scratched at his neck aggressively. I want those kids dead. Anyone who takes out one of those brats gets paid double, and if you give me the rabbit kid's head you get triple yelled out Tamura, whose hair was standing on end and was sporting more electrical burns due to Izuku's lighting attacks. The villains around him looked at each other for a moment before charging the students like an unorganized mob. However, Tamura and Kirijiri did not follow their meat shields. Okay, everyone same positions but Kendo and I will switch. Spoke Izuku quickly. The students were more organized with the tougher, more melee-oriented students in front of those with more ranged quirks behind them. Izuku himself was in the middle of the group, but just before the two groups meet. Boom, the two groups stopped dead in their tracks and looked at the facility's main doors. They had been thrown off their hinges and a cloud of dust had been kicked up. Have no fear, students spoke the unmistakable voice off All Might as he strode out of the dust cloud in his teaching outfit. But most striking was that he wasn't smiling. I am here, spoke All Might as he stood at the top of the stairs, his mere presence frighting some of the villains. Kurajiri, get me out of here. I am done with this failed raid, I want to go home. Leave the others, I don't need them. Ordered Tamira as he glared at All Might who was now standing at the top of the stairs. As you wish, responded Kirijiri opening up a portal that enveloped them both in an instant. Suddenly faster than the eye could see, All Might was no longer at the top of the stairs he was now in between the students and the remaining villains. Some of the students were almost in tears at his appearance, relieved that they were saved. Izuku in particular partly collapsed as the injuries he had accumulated finally proved too much. Thankfully Pony and Yanagi who were standing to either side of him caught him before he could hit the ground. I am so proud of you students you've done a great job. Now all of you get back to the entrance, the rest of the staff are right behind me we can handle it from here. Ordered All Might as he kept his eyes on the villains. Gunshots echoed throughout the USG as the pro hero snipe began opening fire from the top of the stairs. The students happily followed All Might's instructions as they turned and started running back toward the entrance. As his friends helped him up the stairs, Powell Order, Hound Dog, and several dozen clones of ectoplasm ran past them. When they reached the entrance, they saw Recovery Girl along with Midnight treating the heavily injured 13 and Vlad King. You two put him down over there, Recovery Girl will help him. Ordered who Izuku immediately identified as the pro-hero Eraserhead who moved to the stairs to join the fight. Pony and Yanagi laid Izuku down right next to Vlad King. Pony went over to Recovery Girl to tell her about Izuku and see if she could help with the injured. While Yanagi left moving toward a school robot that was carrying a crate with a red plus on it. Izuku's body ached in pain when he tried to move. Yanagi then re-entered his line of sight with a medical kit in hand. Do not attempt to move around too much, you could exacerbate your injuries. Spoke Yanagi eloquently as she kneeled down next to him and opened the kit. Izuku, thank you for saving me, for saving us. We are safe now, thanks in no small part to you, so you can rest easy now. Spoke Yanagi. Yanagi looked right into Izuku's eyes while giving him a small smile, that held a complicated mix of emotions that Izuku couldn't identify. Despite her partly destroyed costume, despite the cuts, the bruises, the dirt, and the blood on her, in a strange way she looked radiant. Izuku would remember the look she was giving him for years to come as the first time he felt like a real hero. Izuku exhaled deeply closing his eyes with a smile on his face and a warm feeling in his chest. 
his focus solely on the feeling of Yanagi's soft hands treating his Wound Yuan nurse's office Monday afternoon. It didn't take too long for the teachers to subdue the remaining villains and rescue the remaining students. As the pro heroes were mopping up, the police and ambulances arrived. The police escorted the students back to safety. While the Ents attended to the wounded, Vlad and 13 were brought to the hospital. Izuku himself was brought back to the recovery girl's office, as she was All Might personal doctor. Some of his more lightly injured classmates were also brought to the nurse's office. Recover Girl treated the students that had enough stamina for her to heal them with her quirk. The majority of the healed students were picked up by their parents or brought home by the police. Those students who weren't very injured or couldn't return home were escorted back to the dorms. Izuku woke up laying in a medical bed, the orange hues of the setting sun coming in from the windows. One of his arms was in a cast along with his right leg, bandages wrapped around him in several places. Acts and pains formed the numerous injuries around his body, flooding his senses. Izuku groaned out in discomfort, catching the attention of the other occupants in the room. Don't move around too much, Sunny. Spoke recovery girl as she approached. How's everyone else? Are they okay? Asked Izuku, concerned about his classmates and teachers. They are fine for the most part, Kaibara and Subaraba. Both suffered broken bones. Vlad and 13 have both been rushed to the IQ, informed All Might as he approached. His first thought after waking is for his comrade's health, thought All Might even more sure of his choice in successor. But you suffered the worst out of all the students. A shattered arm, multiple hairline fractures, six separate contusions, and eleven minor lacerations. Be more careful next time. Spoke recovery girl scolding the teen as she made the medical bed move him to a more seated position and started to double-check a few things now that he was awake. This new angle allowed Izuku to see that there was a man in a tan overcoat standing near the entrance of the room. At his successor's questioning look, All Might waved over the man. Young Midoriya, I'd like you to meet Detective Tsukachi, he is a good friend that I have known for years, he is aware of all my secrets. Spoke All Might clearly indicating that it was safe to discuss one for all in front of the detective. It's good to meet you. I'm sorry to jump straight into business, but I'd like to hear about the events from your perspective. Spoke Tsukachi in a professional tone. Sure I can do that, but there are some things I'd like to mention first if that's okay, responded Izuku. The detective popped his head outside the room to make sure that nobody was listening in then motioned for Izuku to start. Well, the first thing is a villainess with a spider quirk named Lolt knew about me. She was looking for me specifically. The other villains also seem to have some knowledge about the class's quirks, spoke Izuku giving the adult a description of the villainess. That is the theory I came to after interviewing your classmate. The villains were organized and seemed to send them to areas that would seem to place them at a disadvantage. We plan to look into how they got that information. Spoke Tsukachi articulating the seriousness of what this could imply. They also had this thing. The lead villain Tamura called it Namu, and they said it was made to beat All Might. It had multiple quirks that would almost perfectly counter you All Might. Explained Izuku looking at All Might. The adults glanced at each other clearly having a dreadful thought after hearing about the multiple quirks. That is disconcerting. But I heard from your classmates that you were able to defeat this Namu. Spoke All Might clearly proud of his student. I didn't beat it. I just took it out of the fight because I sent it flying. I doubt I would have been able to beat it in a straight fight. I was lucky that I could hit Namu using 100% without hurting myself. I'm still not sure why. My best guess is because Namu's shock absorption quirk lessened the recoil on my own body somehow. I could be wrong thou. But what would have happened if my plan didn't work? Maybe I could have hit Namu with a 100% Tesla smash to its exposed brain that might have been enough to cauterize its entire nervous system preventing it from healing, or maybe if I spoke Izuku as he descended into a mutter storm going over more ways defeating Namu and the other villains. Izuku was giving off a feeling that was uncomfortably similar to the feeling Nezu gave off when he's scheming. Now that's enough of that. 
spoke recovery girl poking the boy's good leg with her cane, snapping Izuku out of his thoughts. Um, where was I? asked Izuku after being snapped out of his muttering. Wait, young Midoriya, what is a Tesla smash, and what's full cowl? asked All Might curious as the technique was definitely not one of his. Izuku turned to his mentor. Oh, it's they are techniques I discovered with Vlad Sensei's help. He's been giving me personal training after school every day since the first heroics class. Full cowl lets me have some control over one for all by spreading it over my whole body. But I can only use about 5% safely. As for my Tesla smash, I make that by harnessing the lightning full cowl generates and shoot it out as a ranged attack. But it has a wind-up time depending on how powerful I want to make it. I also discovered I can shoot blasts of air when I use full cowl, but they're a little underpowered and hard to properly aim. Answered Izuku, happily referring to his teacher. All Might gained a slightly depressed look, he was clearly affected by the fact he was being out-mentored by his colleague. By the way, All Might, was there ever a woman that called you Toshi? Started Izuku addressing his somewhat depressed mentor. All Might snapped out of his funk, the hero's eyes widened at the question. Yes, my mentor Nana Shimura often referred to me as such. How, replied All Might, but Izuku cut him off with another question. Did her quirk involve flight? Or some form of levitation, question Izuku one of his notebooks out on his lap and a pen in his non-broken arm. Yes, her quirk was called float and let her suspend herself in midair. How did you know? asked All Might confused as to how Izuku knew about his mentor since All Might had not mentioned her at all. The adults were also confused about where he got the notebook since he was only wearing a hospital gown. Well, I had this really weird dream where I heard like seven different voices. One of the female voices mentioned Toshi a few times. I was going to ask you about it after class today. Something weird also happened when I was falling after sending Namu flying, I was going to die. I heard the same voice from my dream, and then I was suddenly just floating in midair. Explained Izuku to the best of his ability. That's a lot to take in, you claim to be dreaming of the former bearers, but how? I never experienced this in all my years with one for all. You also have access to a previous holder's quirk, that's not how one for all works. If you had a quirk one for all would just boost it. But you don't have one so one for all should just boost all your physical attributes exactly like it did with me. Spoke All Might, completely out of his depth. I'm not sure honestly. I was hoping you knew something about this. Responded Izuku. The number one hero was deep in thought. Recovery girl, could you perhaps run some tests? It may shed some light on this situation, or at the very least eliminate some possibilities. Asked All Might looking at the doctor. Very well. But I have other priorities, I won't have results until at least after the sports festival if Nizu decides to move forward with it. I'll take the samples I need tomorrow morning. Spoke recovery girl accepting the request. Thank you, replied All Might appreciatively. But the boy needs more training not only with one for all, but also with float, and there's only one person I know who has more experience with those quirk than anyone else on the planet. Started Recovery Girl with a serious look. I don't think that will be necessary. I can handle it. Respond All Might quickly not wanting to involve his old teacher. No, you can't. You sent the boy into the entrance exam without any combat training or any idea of how to use one for all safely. Vlad was able to make time to train him, and he's not even his mentor. You are, so tell me when was the last time you took time to train with him, and Hero 101 doesn't count, I mean one-on-one -on -one training, spoke recovery girl scolding all might like a mother would a child. Well, um, last time was the day of the exam. Spoke All Might nervously while looking away. Clearly not believing him, Recovery Girl turned to Izuku with a Is he really telling the truth? Look. The last time we did one-on-one -on -one training was at the beginning of the month. Spoke Izuku not wanting to be the focus of the old hero's ire. Recovery Girl sent a glare at All Might that caused the no one to flinch before his head lowered in defeat. I'll call him tomorrow. Spoke All Might dreading the idea of making the call. 
Oh no, you'll just chicken out. You call him right now or I will, spoke Recovery Girl sternly. Um, who are you talking about? asked Izuku, curious who could make All Might act like this. My, my mentor, the man who taught me, replied All Might as his legs shook in fear. Really? What's he like? Is he a pro hero? asked Izuku, clearly excited at the idea of meeting the man who trained the symbol of peace. He's terrifying, whispered All Might voice wavering. Don't mind him, dear. I'm going to make sure he makes the call while you talk to the detective. I'll heal you up once he's done with his questions. Oh, and you have to go and talk to Hound Dog tomorrow. All the students involved have to talk to him. Spoke Recovery Girl kindly as she ushered All Might out of the room. Okay, where would you like me to start? Asked Izuku, moving his full attention to the detective that had quietly stayed out of the conversion till now. Start from when your class gets on the bus and go from there in as much detail as possible. Responds Tsukachi, pulling out his small notebook again to write the information. Izuku did what he was asked and recounted the events he experienced from the moment he stepped on the bus to him waking up in the nurse's office. He explained everything in as much detail as he could recall. Izuku explained the villain's appearances, quirks, everything that they said, and how they were subdued. Tsukachi frantically wrote every word down, underlining anything he considered important. That should be all, thank you very much for your help. If you recall any more details you can contact me with this number. Goodbye and good luck during the sports festival. Spoke Tsukachi professionally as he passed the teen a card with his contact info. You're welcome and have a good day, responded Izuku politely giving the detective a nod as he exited the room. Recovery girl re-entered the room shortly after the detective left. The pro heroine pulled some food from a refrigerator near her desk and then moved to his bedside. Here, have some of this. You must be famished. Spoke recovery girl as she handed him a small snack along with a bottle of water. Izuku, having not had anything to eat since launch, eagerly ate the offered food. Once he was finished, recovery girl lowered his medical bed. The teachers have a staff meeting, I'll check up on you after it's done. But you should be right as rain in the morning and don't worry about classes. They have been cancelled for the next two days. Explained Recovery Girl before her lips stretched, planting a quick smooch on his forehead. A green glow enveloped Izuku and he could feel the pain from his injuries ebb away. Thank ya on you. Spoke Izuku the side effects of Recovery Girls quickly catching up with him as he rapidly fell asleep. Recovery Girl quietly moved to the exit, she dimmed the office lights and then left for the teacher's meeting. Not even five minutes after the heroine left the door slide open and someone slipped in. Kanoko was grateful for Recovery Girl with the help of the Ems. She was able to remove the piece of the harpoon still in her leg and rapidly close the flesh wound with a quick kiss right before Kinko's eyes. Her parents were currently rushing to the school to pick her up. Kinoko wanted to check on Izuku before they showed up to take her home. But Recovery Girl was not allowing visitors until tomorrow. So Kinoko waited for the nurse to leave before sneaking in. She slowly and quietly slipped into the dark infirmary and approached the bed Izuku was resting in, mindful not to hit anything in the dark. She needed to be quick, she didn't know when Recovery Girl would be back. She looked at Izuku for a moment, watching his chest rise and fall. She watched him sleep for a moment, making sure he was 100% asleep. I, I know that I can only say this because you're asleep right now, and I'm not sure how to say this. But I wanted to thank you, you've saved me again today. It was the second time I was sure I was going to die, and it was you that appeared out of nowhere to save me both times, I know you're going to be a great hero. Spoke Kanoko quietly as she gently took hold of one of his hands with her own before she continued. You're amazing, you know that. You're kind and humble and determined and intelligent and heroic and handsome and I find your mumbling cute and your serious mode hot. That's probably why I spoke Kanoko pausing not able to say what she wanted. She took a few moments before she continued. I don't want to regret not taking this chance later in my life. We will be risking our lives as heroes, we could die when we least expect it. 
I want to be together with you. I just don't have the courage to tell you how I feel yet, so I'm going to get stronger. I need to prove to myself that I can stand beside you as a hero and not just be another person you have to save. I'll save you next time and when I do. Spoke Kanoko with determination. Her eyes locked on Izuku's sleeping face. The girl carefully leans over. I'll tell you exactly how much I love you, whispered Kanoko, gently kissing his cheek. No fair Kanoko, we want to kiss him too, whispered Pony, a slight pout on her face. Kanoko let out a muffled squeak in surprise and lost her balance as she jolted upright. The mushroom girl should have fallen to the ground, but she was caught midair by Yanagi with her quirk. The three girls stared at Izuku worried he'd wake up from the commotion, but the green-haired boy barely stirred in his sleep. The two approached Kanoko as Yanagi gently brought Kanoko back to her feet. H. How long have you two been there? asked Kanoko quietly clearly embarrassed, if the deep blush on her face was any indication. We have been here since you began listing Izuku's good attributes, answered Riaiko bluntly, releasing her telekinetic hold on Kanoko. Kanoko that was so sweet. I didn't know you liked Izuku too whispered Pony happily slipping into English. Before Kanoko could respond, Riaiko placed one hand on each of the girl's shoulders. I believe it best if we converse in another location, as to not disrupt his sleep. Spoke Riaiko gesturing to Izuku's still sleeping form. Kanoko and Pony both nodded in agreement. Kanoko started to walk toward the door, but glanced back when she noticed that Pony and Riaiko weren't beside her. The two heroines were both leaned over Izuku. Pony kissed one of his cheeks, stifling a giggle with her hand after she stood straight. Riaiko leaned in after Pony, she caressed the boy's cheek as she gave his forehead a quick kiss. Once they were finished Yanagi and Pony quietly rushed out of the room, ushering a slightly stunned Kanoko with them. With a quick pause to ensure none of the staff were watching they slipped out of the room. Yanagi sliding the door closed with her quirk in their wake. Once outside the room, the three moved down a couple of halls before stopping. The three stood in awkward silence for a few moments. Yes, so you two both like Izuku? asked Kanoko, breaking the silence. Her tone was unsure and her gaze was on the floor. Yes, we both are very fond of him and have orchestrated a united reveal of our desires to him. However, the assault by those cutthroats sabotaged and delayed our efforts. Responded Riaiko honestly, her tone neutral. Kanoko didn't really understand what Yanagi said and looked at Pony hoping for a better explanation. We were planning on confessing to Izuku today after class, but because of the villain attack, we have to wait till tomorrow. At least we might be able to squeeze a date with Izu before class starts again added Pony clearly happy at the idea of a date and confident about Izuku accepting the confessions. Wait, both of you plan to date him? questioned Kanoko, a little confused. Yes, we had a discussion, and we agreed to share him. Such relationships are not unheard of. There is a family on my street that I babysat for during middle school, and their family consists of a pair of sisters married to the same man. Explained Riaiko, providing an example. I guess she has a point. That kind of relationship isn't illegal or socially frowned on, just kinder rare thought Kanoko mulling over what she had been told. Since you like Izuku too, do you want to confess with us tomorrow? That way all three of us can be with him. Offered Pony, happy to include her friend since he knew she genuinely seemed to care for Izuku. Kanoko didn't answer right away. She wasn't necessary against the idea of sharing Izuku but she hadn't dated anyone before and was understandably conflicted. Do not feel as if you must answer. If you require more time to reach a decision or gather your resolve, then take as much time as you require. Only confess when you are ready. However, Pony and I are ready and we will confess to him tomorrow, stated Riaiko in a polite but firm tone. But you're welcome to join us when you're ready. We can tell you really like Izu added Pony with a happy smile. Thank you. I'll be sure to let you both know when I'm ready. By the way, W would you two like to train together for the sports festival? asked Kanoko tentatively as she shifted the topic away from her crush. 
Of course we would, answered Pony pulling Kanoko into an excited hug. Riaiko also agreed to the question. Before Kanoko could thank the girls her phone chimed. Kanoko pulled out her phone. It's my parents, I have to go to the front gate, spoke Kanoko as she put her phone away. In that case, we will escort you to the gate, we discuss ideas for training, spoke Yanagi. The three girls walked toward the front gate. The three discuss how they would train and when. UA staff meeting room. The sun had fully set and the whole of U.S. staff bearing the injured 13 and Vlad King sat in the very same meeting room where they reviewed the entrance exam. Detective Tukachi was also present to give the pro heroes the police's preliminary report. I think it's time to begin, please give me a moment. Spoke Nezu as he typed on his tablet. The main screen in the room showed the words connecting for a moment before a man sitting in an airplane appeared on the screen. He wore an outfit nearly identical to Nezu's normal outfit, the only difference being his tie was blue instead of Nezu's red. His build easily marked him as the second tallest staff member. His brown hair was short and cut close on the sides. A scar led from the left side of his neck up the side of his face and over his left eye. Normally his green eyes would be brimming with energy and hints of mischief, currently however, his eyes had more in common with Aizawa's. The prominent bags under his eyes easily spotted behind his rectangular glasses. Hello brother, I'm glad you could join us. How are you doing? Spoke Nezu addressing his only family. Well besides getting an alert that our school was attacked in the middle of my meeting with the German Ministry of Education and the German Ministry of Heroes, dropping everything and getting on the first available flight back home. While being worried out of my mind, I've been worse but let us get to the matter at hand. Responded Vice Principal Andy with a tired smile and a sarcastic tone before becoming more serious. Nezu gestured for Tsukachi to begin. Our investigators are trying to learn everything they can about this so-called League of Villains. We have made some progress already, but we can't find anything on this Tamura Shigaraki. So far we've searched our databases, but we haven't found anyone that comes close to matching his discretion or quirk. The same goes for the warp villain Kirijiri. So they are not citizens, or they are using aliases either way hard to find. Spoke Tsukachi as he let the heroes digest the information. So what you're saying is we don't know anything. Commented Eraserhead. We have to track them down, according to the students, the ringleader was injured pretty badly. But once he's healed up, I bet he'll try something like this again, what a pain. Spoke Snipe frustrated that the villain had escaped. I think that this Shigaraki would do just that. From the testimony of the students we know, he was quick to monologue bragging about this, Namu's many quirks as if he was a pet. He made wild immature claims and according to the students the moment things stopped going in Shigaraki's favor, he became physically upset like he was going to throw a tantrum. The analysts likened his mentality to that of a spoiled child with an inflated ego. Spoke Tsukachi as the villain's psychological profile was placed on the screen. Great and unstable man-child wielding a deadly quirk. This is going to be troublesome. Spoke P.P. Whirloader clearly angry at this villain. Since he might have no record, it's possible that he never got the quirk counseling that students receive during elementary and middle school. Commented Midnight. That may be so, but it doesn't really matter now. Spoke Snipe. Before the detective continued his report. There were 72 villains arrested in the aftermath of the usage attack. They were, for the most part, small-time thugs that usually lurked around back alleys. However, we identified three villains on the most wanted list. The hero hunter war chief wanted for repeated attacks on pro-heroes, armed robbery, and murder. The serial killer Gideon, who has been linked to over a dozen murder and kidnapping cases. The spider villainous Lolt wanted for numerous robberies, art theft, and numerous charges relating to being a broker of illegal goods and services. Unfortunately, it appears all three escaped by some unknown means. But what worries me is how this man-child convinced all these villains to join in on his crazy plan. We do not know what convinced the higher-ranked villains to follow him. But the lower-ranked villains viewed him as a real leader. 
We believe they were so quick to back such a simple-minded villain. Because the villains have been feeling more pressure since the country is brimming with heroes. Spoke Tsukachi as he put forth his concerns as pictures of some of the villains were shown. That does make sense. Comment Cementos. There are many people looking for a cause to get behind. Spoke Snipe in agreement. I'll be taking to the students involved to ensure they aren't suffering from any PTSD as a result of experiencing this attack. Spoke Hound Dog doing his best not to growl in anger at these villains for attacking children. So what do we do to stop them? Asked Midnight. We plan to expand our investigation and continue searching for the perpetrators that planned this attack. Responded Sukachi. This man-child may very well have someone guiding him nurturing his malice. They may also be providing resources to this organization. Spoke Mezu putting forth a hypothesis. For now we should be vigilant. They will attack again when they are ready. Spoke All Might. What information have you learned about this Namu? From what I've read so far, I find its existence worrying, to say the least. Asked Andy concern laced in his tone. We found the villain Namu in a crater on the other side of the campus. He is for the most part unresponsive, but did follow orders from the officers. He also seems to be unable to speak. From what we have gathered, Namu possesses immense speed and strength. He also possessed a shock absorption quirk and a super regeneration quirk along with several other quirks. The villains claimed Namu to be an artificial being. A research team will be analyzing Namu after he is transferred to Tartarus. Explained Tsukachi as a picture of Namu in police custody. If this Namu was in fact artificially created, it may be wise to consider that this league of villains has the means to create more beings like this Namu. Cementos, I will need your assistance in constructing countermeasures. Spoke Andy seriously his hands steepled in front of him in thought. The other heroes digested the idea of more of those things running around. I'll be sure to gather the needed materials for you. Responded Cementos with a nod. What about the injured? Has there been any news? Asked Midnight. The occupants of the room all turned to Recovery Girl. Thirteen and Vlad King had to be brought to the IQ with severe injuries, but they have been stabilized and should pull through. I plan to go to the hospital tomorrow and see if they are well enough for my quirk, but they'll have to take it easy for a while. The students for the most part only had light to moderate injuries. Two students suffered broken bones. The only student that suffered severe injuries was Izuku Midoriya. Informed Recovery Girl I told you that kid shouldn't have been accepted. I saw that he had to be carried to safety by his classmates. He probably made himself helpless by using his quirk. He's lucky that he's alive and didn't endanger his classmates more. Spoke Eraserhead clearly relishing in his I told you so moment given their rarity for him. All Might and Nezu did not look pleased with this statement. A cough for Tsukachi got the room's attention. Actually, according to the students, he led several of them against the villains, subduing many of them, faced the high-ranked villains I mentioned earlier, secured the wounded Vlad King, and saved Yanagi and Kamori from Tamura. His classmates also state that he fought Namu one-on-one -on -one and was the one to send Namu flying through the Ustis roof, after which he was planning on commanding his classmates against the remaining villains despite the fact he was severely injured. But fortunately, that is when you all arrived, explained Tsukachi. The smug look on Erasurehead's face vanished at the words. My, my, that is impressive. We are fortunate to have such a student in our school. Glad we didn't lose the young man to some other hero school. I cannot wait to meet him. Commented Andy with a large smug look aimed at Erasurehead. Nezu shared the same look. Eraserhead's head sunk into his capture scarf, and he was grumbling under his breath, knowing that Vlad was going to gloat when he returned. After talking to the students, we also came to the conclusion that the villains obtained not only the lesson plan and details about the Usch itself, but also seemed to have at least some knowledge on the students' quirks. Continued Tsukachi drawing the hero's attention back to him. Do we have any idea on how they got the information? asked Midnight. I got at least a partial answer after reviewing the security camera footage, said Powerloader. 
as he displays several camera angles. One view was from inside Nezu's office, and another was the hallway just outside. They all watched as Nezu was sipping tea while working on his computer. While several students walked through the hallway, some carrying phones and lunch bags. Notably, a group of first-year hero course students also passed by all of them had their phones out. The group consisted of Sen Kaibara, Kosai Tsuburaba Huryu Rin, along with Class A's Minoru Mainta, Denki Kaminari, and Hanta Siro. Then the alarm started going off indicating the press had trespassed. The Nezu in the recording quickly locked his computer and left the room. The pro heroes and the detective watched as Kirijiri wrapped into the room. The villain quickly pulled out some sort of device and connected it to the computer. After the drive flashed green he took the device and left. The device was some sort of remote hacking tool that allowed someone off-site access to our systems. From what I can tell they were only able to get to the lesson plan and us the blueprints before they hit a brick wall trying to get the student records. They also tried to overwrite the recording and succeeded with the original. But they didn't get to alter the backup the system automatically saved when the alarm was set off. I also found a backdoor they placed in the system. Explained Power Loader, showing the altered video of the empty office. Good work Power Loader. But that still leaves how they got the information on the students. The lesson plan doesn't give that information and from the statements of the students, it's clear that the information the villains had on them was superficial or incomplete spoke Nezu. What if they have a mole on the inside? That might explain things. Proposed present Mike causing the room to tense ever so slightly. That seems like a leap to me. If it was one of the staff the villains wouldn't need to make a distraction or to hack into the computer system. We all already have access to that information. Spoke Cementos bringing up a good point. While I dislike the idea of being suspicious of our students, we cannot dismiss any possibility until we have investigated all of the facts. Spoke Andy a sigh slipping past his lips. Most of the students are being escorted home by the police. A few of the students that are dorming will be staying on campus. We will also be moving forward with the sports festival. We will increase security for the event this year. Stated Nezu his decision made. Thank you for your time, Detective Tsukachi. Please keep us informed of any developments in the case. Continued Nezu politely. The detective gave his goodbyes and showed himself out. That will be all for today. Snipe Eraserhead, thank you for volunteering to watch over the campus. Once Hound Dog and Present Mike swap with you, the both of you are free to rest tomorrow. I'll see the rest of you tomorrow. Spoke Nezu, addressing the two pro heroes. Thanks, boss. Good night. Come on, partner place ain't gonna protect itself. Spoke Snipe in his thick accent. Eraserhead just grumbled and stood with his colleague. Both left to begin their patrol of the school. Good night, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Spoke Cementos with a small bow. I'll double check to make sure the security system is all set. Before I head. Spoke Power Loader. I'll be checking on Midoriya before I go home. Sleep well, everyone, spoke Recovery Girl as she left to head for her office. I have some patrolling I need to do in the city before I finish for today, explained Ectoplasm. I'll go with you. I promised I'd cover Eraserhead's normal patrol, spoke Present Mike speaking way too loud. Good night, spoke All Might internally dreading the fact Gran Torino wanted to talk to him in person tomorrow. Nezu turned his attention to his brother. Andy, when will your flight be arriving at the airport? asked Nezu. I should be arriving early in the morning. I'll take a taxi and should be on campus before noon at the earliest. Answered Andy. You don't need to take a taxi. I can pick you up. Offered Midnight a smirk on her face. Thank you, Nimiri. I owe you one. Respond Andy with a tired but genuine smile. Oh, then I have a few ideas on how you can repay me, spoke Midnight in a sultry and teasing tone. Andy used to Nimiri's teasing and hide his reaction well. But the subtle hint to his flustered feelings was apparent to her. We can negotiate on our drive back. Good night, Nimiri Nezu, responded Andy in a hurried but tone calm. 
before he terminated the call from his end. Midnight clearly still amused at the interaction, pulled out her phone to send a text as she stood to follow Nezu out of the room. Now what do you have brewing? Questioned Nezu seeing the scheming look Midnight was giving her phone. The heroine simply showed her boss who she was texting. Nezu immediately began laughing maniacally for a moment, knowing exactly what she was up to and laughing at his brother's future misfortune. Well then, I'll leave my brother in your capable hands, just be sure he's in one piece when you arrive. I'll see you tomorrow and be sure to get some sleep. Spoke Nezu, chuckling as they parted ways. Yua nurse's office late Tuesday morning. Sunlight poured in through the infirmary's windows, Izuku stirred from his sleep. His eyes slowly opened at first, he was confused as to where he was. But he quickly realized his location when the smell of disinfectant made himself known. The student yawned surprised that he was mostly pain-free, but he couldn't properly stretch due to the bandages and casts. Good morning, how are you feeling? spoke Recovery Girl as she hopped off her chair and approached him. Good morning, Recovery Girl. I have some aches and slight pain, but I feel great for the most part, replied Izuku as he sat up with a smile. That's good. I'll give you a once-over and see if we can get you out of those casts, spoke Recovery Girl as she began to examine Izuku. It didn't take the school nurse long to determine that Izuku was well enough to be released, the heroine expertly removed the bandages and casts on his body. Just as the last of the bandages were being removed the infirmary door opened and Hound Dog stepped in. Midoriya, you have a Vistaster, spoke the canine hero before a green blur rushed into the room and seized Izuku in a hug only a mother or a bear could give. Izuku, my baby? I was so worried about you, are you okay?" spoke Inko her tears soaking the bed as she frantically checks over her son. Mom, respond Izuku surprised and a bit embarrassed by the sudden embrace. But he returned it all the same. Recovery girl cleared her throat getting the small family's attention. Izuku is nearly completely recovered, he just needs to take it easy for a day or two. I'd also recommend a hearty meal to properly recover from my quick side effects. Informed recovery girl professionally. I've got just the thing for that. Responded Inko whipping her eyes and smiling brightly. Before pulling out several Tupperware containers from the bag that hung from her shoulder. When the school called me and told me that you were injured. I was going to rush right over. But Principal Nezu said you were already asleep and that the press was swarming the school's entrance pestering parents picking up the students. He said it would be best to come in the morning so one of the faculty could escort me to prevent the press from swarming me when I tried to enter. So I ended up cooking your favorites since I figured you'd be hungry when you woke up." Spoke Inko mutters in a similar way to how her son did as she presented the food. The other three occupants of the room stared at the sheer amount of food the women had brought. I may have made too much, since I was so worried. Spoke Inko in embarrassment as she looked at enough food to easily feed half a dozen people. The heroes were wonder how she fit so much in the relatively small bag. That's fine mom, maybe we can share some with my doormates, proposed Izuku already spotting some of his favorite foods. That's a good idea honey, it'd be nice to meet your friends before parents day, we can go home after you all have finished eating spoke Inko as she quickly started putting away the food. Actually, Mom, I'd like to stay in the dorms. If that's okay, asked Izuku as he got off the bed and stretched out. Inko hesitated, only after a long pause did she respond. Okay, you can stay, responded Inko clearly not thrilled but accepting his decision. The mother then turned to the school nurse. Thank you for taking care of my son spoke Inko bowing to Recovery Girl in appreciation. Izuku mirrored his mother and also gave his thanks. You're welcome. I hope your boy doesn't have to be brought here again anytime soon, responded the elderly heroine kindly. Mr. Hound Dog, will you be joining us? inquired Inko as she and Izuku followed the hero out of the infirmary. Sorry, I can't. I have some work that needs doing. Izuku, be sure to escort her to the gate when she plans to leave and come to my office tomorrow when you have some free time. Spoke Hound Dog. 
Yes, Hound Dog Sensei, spoke Izuku acknowledging his teacher's request. The small green-haired family of two parted ways from Hound Dog, Izuku leading the way to his dorm. Tokyo International Airport Tuesday. The vice principal of UA stepped out of the airport's main exit. He was surrounded by a veritable river of people moving all over the place, some meeting family, others hailing taxis, others that moved toward buses, and staff moving between tasks. The pro hero had traveled very light, having everything he needs spilt between a single suitcase and a large backpack. The hero's eyes searched the area hoping to spot Nimura or one of the school's cars. When his search proved fruitless, he unslung his backpack and opened it. He pulled out a metal figure of a sleeping wyvern roughly the size of his hand. The figure despite clearly being old was in great condition. Sparing a moment to appreciate the old gift, Andy looked inward activating his quick his hands glowed for a moment and Andy felt the sliver of energy his quirk needed to animate the object. He smiled as the figure's texture shift becoming more lifelike, its chest beginning to rise as it inhales and its eyes open. It stood up on its two legs, stretching its wings out. It opened its mouth in a big yawn as if waking from a long sleep, a small plume of flame materializing out of its open mouth briefly before the fire died. Wow, whispered a young voice in wonder. The hero and the toy both turned to see a small child holding into her mother's hand while staring wide-eyed at the toy come to life. The mother on the other hand was more focused on him, probably recognizing him. He gave the two civilians a smile, and with a simple thought, the living toy took flight. The toy flew above the unsuspecting crowd while easily avoiding any obstacles in its path. Andy placed his backpack back on and patiently waited for the toy to find his ride. He only had to wait five minutes before it returned perching itself on one of his shoulders. It let out a happy chirp reminiscent of a baby crocodile. With another mental command sent to his creature, it flew off his shoulders and he followed after it, maneuvering through the crowd. The scaled creature proceeds to land on the hood of an SUV with tinted windows, parked in between several tucks. He immunity recognized it as one of the school's vehicles. Andy didn't break his stride toward the car, even when the driver door opened and Nimuri stepped out wearing tight black pants, flats, a simple blouse, and her hair pulled up in a bun. But he wasn't expecting the passenger doors to open, and he froze the moment he spotted the two blondes. He watched the Rukos step out of the car. Tsuchikawa was wearing a dress that reached past her knees and heels. Tatsuma wore a hoodie, jeans, and a pair of boots. Hi, senpai, it's been a while. Spoke Tatsuma with a gentle smile as she approached, scooping up the living toy as she passed. Far too long, this kitty cat missed you so much. Spoke Tsuchikawa as she essentially pounced on one of his arms, pressing herself against his free arm. So about that favor, let's negotiate. Spoke Nimiri in a suggestive tone as she ran a hand along his jaw. At that moment a single thought dominated his mind at that one moment. I'm in danger thought Andy with a nervous chuckle as he was practically dragged into the car. Class 1B Dorms Noon When Izuku and his mother entered the dorms it didn't take long for some of his classmates to come to the common room. Yanagi, Pony, Satsuna, and Kami were happy to see their class rep. Izu, you're back. It's good to see you're okay. Called out Pony as she pulls the boy into a very tight hug, instantly making him blush, but also making it hard for him to breathe. Thanks, but Pony, could you put me down? Squeaked out Izuku, tapping Pony's arm as a sign to tap out. Pony immediately complied, placing him down. It is a relief to witnesses that you are well enough to be released, commented Yanagi, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. Good to see you all patched up, you had us worried about you, Prez, commented Sitsuner, wrapping an arm around him. Hey fam, who's the lady? asked Kami. Izuku saw the amused look his mother was giving him, and the blush on his face grew darker, quickly breaking free from Sitsuna's hold. So guys, I'd like you to meet my mother. Mom, these are Pony, Satsuna, Yanagi, and Kami. They are some of my classmates. Spoke Izuku introducing the girls, 
who seemed to perk up at meeting Izuku's mom. Hello, I'm Inko Midoriya. It's nice to meet friends of my Izuku. I brought some food if you'd like some. Spoke Inko with a smile and a powerful maternal aura as she starts to unpack the food she brought. This stuff looks like it slaps I'm in. Spoke Kami to a slightly confused Inko. Nice to meet the mom of the class cinnamon roll. Plus we were coming down here to make something to eat. Said Satsuna with a toothy grin. Izuku blushed at Satsuna's teasing, and his blush doubled down when the other girls agreed with the nickname. His mom seemed far too happy at that statement. Wonderful, I'll just take a moment to reheat this. Spoke Inko happy, but before she could grab the Tupperware, it started to float above the table. Please allow me to assist you in reheating the food. Spoke Yanagi politely as she used her quirk to float the food into the kitchen. Thank you, dear, Izuku didn't mention one of his classmates had a telekinetic quirk. Responded Inko impressed by Yanagi's control. I'll help too, I'm really curious about what Izuku was like when he was younger. Added Satsuna leading Inko into the kitchen, but not before throwing a mischievous grin at Izuku. Let's see if I can learn more about that angry Pomeranian thought Satsuna, eager to discover if her and Kendo's suspicions were correct. Izuku and the others were relegate to setting the table and waiting. He was such an excitable one always full of energy, so sweet and well-mannered. Began Inko, clearly happy to talk about her son. Yanagi quietly listened, curious about the boy she liked. Inko turned on the stove. Huh, so he's always been a cinnamon roll. He must have had loads of friends. Commented Satsuna while she grabbed the kneaded pots and pans. Inko seemed to deflate at the statement. He did for a time, but after the other kids' quirks came in, they treated him differently. Katsuki was the only one left. Spoke Inko in a melancholic manner. The name caused both Yanagi and Setsuna to still. Katsuki? As in Bakugo blonde hair explosion quirk? Questioned Setsuna, not believing for a second that the arrogant and anger blonde who attacked them for no good reason was anything close to a friend to Izuku. Yes, that's him. He and Izuku have been attending the same schools since they were in preschool. His mother and I have been friends since middle school. Do you know him? Spoke Inko ignorant of her Pudo nephew's true relationship with her son. We are familiar with him, he started Yanagi, her tone clearly agitated and most likely about to mention the incident from the cafeteria, only for Satsuna to cover her mouth. Is actually is part of Class A. We meet him the first day of classes. He's a little much. Spoke Satsuna in what she hoped was a conveying polite tune. Satsuna made eye contact with Yanagi mouth the words don't, we'll talk later. He can be a little loud, but he is a good kid. But let's go serve the food, spoke Inko with a smile as she begins to plate the food. XXX many. Many hours of embarrassing girl talk later XXX. Izuku was certain that if it was possible to die of embarrassment, then he was moments away from dying. Satsuna had gotten his mom to start telling more stories about when he was younger. The other girls encouraged Inko. Thankfully for Izuku, he got a small reprieve when his mom started asking questions about the girls and Yue in general. But the embarrassment returned full force when Pony had asked if Inko had any pictures of Izuku when he was little. Which prompted Inko to take out her phone and start flipping through the digital album that Izuku had complied for Mother's Day years back. The other boys had not come to help him when they came down to the common room. Kaibara and Subaraba both politely declined the offer of food, both of them stating they had plans to eat off campus, while Rin had taken some food but returned to his dorm to continue a video call he was having with his parents. Oh, here's a picture of him a little before he was four, he loved to rescue me from bad guys in that outfit. He was always so full of energy. Spoke Inko fondly showing a picture of a little Izuku in an All Might onesies. OMG, that is so sweet, I think it gave me a cavity. Gushed Kami her hands on her cheeks. He's so cute, spoke Pony wishing she had a copy of the photo. Bismidoria, are you all right? Questioned Yanagi, noticing the mother sniffle quietly. 
Oh, nothing, it's just nice to see Izuku have so many friends, episcally a bunch of nice girls like you. Spoke Inko smiling but quickly rubbing her eyes to prevent herself from tearing up. Mum, spoke Izuku clearly embarrassed but more so tearing up along with his mother. But before the female students could be witness to the Midoriya family tears flood the common room. Cough, excuse me, interrupted All Might in his skeletal form wearing his baggy yellow suit. Um, not to sound rude, but who are you? questioned Setsuna in a semi-serious tone, understandable a little suspicious since she and her class were attacked the day before. Ah uh, yes, I am Tashinori Yagi and I act as an assistant teacher here at Yua, I also double as a substitute when needed. Spoke Toshi explaining his secret ID's cover story. It is nice to meet another member of the Yua faculty Tashinori Sensei. What business do you hear? questioned Yanagi politely. I was told to inform that visiting hours will be ending soon and that I will be escorting her home today. Informed Toshsi, at his words the group looked at the clock hanging on one of the common room's walls to see the time. Oh dear, it's much later than I thought. I think I'll head home. It was a pleasure meeting you girls, I look forward to seeing you in action on Parents' Day. Spoke Inko sweetly. Goodbye, Miss. Midoriya, I look forward to our next encounter. Spoke Yanagi in her normal tone. Yeah, it was nice meeting you, Mamadoriya added Setsuna with a smirk, before she and Yanagi slipped away to have a private conversion. Thanks for the food, it was mad dope. Till next time, thanked Kami as she started to collect the empty plates to clean. We'll show you what we can do on Friday, spoke Pony, excited to show her stuff to her crush's mom. I'll walk you to the entrance, mom, spoke Izuku standing from the table. In that case, I'll get the car and bring it to the entrance spoke Toshsi with a nod as he slipped out of the building. Thank you, dear, spoke Inko as she made sure she wasn't leaving anything behind. Izu want to watch more anime with me and Yanagi when you come back? asked Pony quietly in English. Sure, Pony, I'd like that, responded Izuku with a smile as he stepped out of the building with his mother. Pony excitedly rushed upstairs to make sure everything was ready, here hoof falls echoing through the common room as she eagerly entered the elevator. Yanagi took a moment to appreciate the dorm's small courtyard and garden, while Setsuna ensured their conversion wouldn't be eavesdropped on. Once Setsuna was sure, she turned to Yanagi. So as you know Bakugo is an asshole, spoke Setsuna as if stating a fact. That is quite self-evident. What confuses me is why you'd prevent me from informing his mother of the incident? asked Yanagi brow raised. Well, Kendo, and I think that he possibly bullied Izuku since Izuku was a late bloomer. Started Setsuna before Yanagi cut in. That would not surprise me in the least. The brute appears the sort to judge others' worth entirely on their quirks. If Izuku's quirk didn't come in till the exam, he'd be a prime target for abuse which explains why he referred to Izuku as Deku useless. Spoke Yanagi the agitation clear in her tone. That was our guess. But Izuku started to defend the guy and make excuses for his actions in the cafe. We want Izuku to realize that he shouldn't defend the bastard. Spoke Setsuna also angry at Bakugo. Which is why you inquired about his upbringing. Spoke Yanagi in realization. Exactly, we wanted more info before talking to Izuku about it. Now we know that this has mostly been going on for years and that Bakego made sure to keep him isolated. Spoke Setsuna outlining what they learned. This also may explain Izuku's skittish nature and stutter. Added Yanagi. Man, this school should require a psychic evaluation or something before accepting students. Sai, I'll call Kendo and let her know what I found out. When we talk to Izuku do you want to help? Spoke Setsunsa pulling out her cell phone. Yes, I desire to assist you in throwing off this burden of his past. I do not wish for Izuku to be tied down with this weight. Spoke Yanagi agreeing to help talk to Izuku. Villain hideout unknown location. All for one sat on his throne, the room was dark, with only the light of half a dozen monitors casting light. 
The chatter of the newscasters discussing the USJ attack drowned out the beeps and winds of the numerous medical machines that were keeping him alive. The ancient villain was contemplating the aftermath of Tamira's plan. He knew actually killing All Might during the attack was unlikely but was still a possibility. So he was not disappointed when his apprentice returned without All Might's head. He had not expected Tamira to return so injured or for Namu to be defeated by a child and captured. However, despite all that he still considered the event a success as he watches the media question U.S. competency. All for one turned his head slightly to look at a spot in the room. Not even a moment later a warp gate appeared in the spot. Out of the portal stepped out Dr. Kaokudai Garaki, his personal physician, before Kurajiri, his loyal servant, appeared from the warp gate. What is the diagnosis, doctor? asked All for One as he turned back to the monitors. He has severe burns on his chest and one of his arms. He's having issues with moving the arm and breathing causes some pain. He has several puncture wounds on his palms, arms and torso and a large stab wound to his shoulder. He will be out of commission for several weeks at least, but there is something strange about his wounds. Spoke Dr. Gudai clearly not caring that Shigaraki was injured. Strange explained ordered all for one hid tone authority. The inures that came from this lighting attack that Kirajiri told us about don't seem to be healing properly despite my best efforts. They will scar and they will lower Tamura's combat effectiveness. Informed Dr. Kudai Garaki intrigued by the situation. <clears throat> Unfortunate. Kirajiri, what do we know about the child that caused this? Spoke all for one. The mist villain bowed in respect before stepping forward. The student's name is Izuku Midoriya, his quirk is called tactile telekinesis and although powerful has a severe backlash that damages the user. Spoke Kirijiri, going over what information they had on the boy. Is that all? questioned Dr. Kudai. Yes, our informant deemed the boy a non-threat due to the severity of the backlash and the meek nature of the bearer, so chose to get more information on the stronger students answered Kirajiri glancing at the doctor. Have him focus his efforts on this Midoriya. I'd like more information on how his quirk works. Now leave. Ordered all for one dismissing the two with a wave. As you wish, responded Kirajiri with a bow warping him and the doctor away. All for one refocused his attention on the science already adjusting his plans to account for this possible troublemaker. Later that night in the dorms. When Izuku returned to the dorms, he was eager to hang out with Pony and Yanagi. He was curious to see what would happen next in the anime they watched last time. But he was slightly confused to find the two girls in their pajamas and slippers waiting for him in front of his room, and his face grew flush at seeing Yanagi in a large black t-shirt that contrasted well with her pale skin. The shirt ended around her knees. Pony herself was in a spaghetti strap and pajama pants but the fact her hair was pulled back showing her horse-like ears was a cute look in Izuku's opinion. Izu, we thought it would be best to hang out in your room this time, spoke Pony holding. All she needed to stream the anime like last time. Sure, Pony, that sounds fine, responded Izuku as he averted his gaze from Pony, because her top did little to conceal her cleavage. Izuku unlocked and entered his room, the two girls slipping in behind him. Pony happily starting setting up while Yanagi placed snacks and drinks down. Izuku was still self-conscious about his room, but the two heroines didn't seem to mind. Once everything was ready the two girls sat down on his bed, propping some of his pillows against the wall as a makeshift backrest. Izuku was placed right in between the two girls. The three were only three episodes in before they started to cheer, comment and laugh at the screen. Hours flew by as the three enjoyed themselves, but once the final episode of the arc they were on started, Pony sent a subtle signal to Yanagi causing both girls to move to the next step. Pony proceeded to cuddle up to Izuku's side, while Yanagi took hold of his hand and leaned her head on his shoulder. Izuku's heart started racing and internally he was panicking. He barely notices when the credits started to roll and Yanagi used her quirk to turn on the light. W well that was a good arc, commented Izuku trying to calm himself down. 
but instead of answering, both girls pulled away and faced him together. Izu, we have something we want to tell you, spoke Pony, her tone nervous. This confused Izuku especially when he noticed Pony blushing, and even. Okay, what did you want to tell me? responded Izuku his confusion growing after seeing a large blush on the normally stoic Yanagi. The girl looked at each other for a moment, nodding at each other before turning to him once again. Izu I like you, Izuku I am fond of you, please go out with us, spoke both Yanagi and Pony at the same time. Izuku's eyes widened as he processed their words, and then he reacted in the similar manner his mother did when she was given shocking news. Izuku's eyes rolled back into his head as he promptly fainted. Izuku, called out the girls as the teen's body collapsing onto his bed. Izuku's room Tuesday night. Izuku slowly came back to consciousness. The first sensations he felt were that of the best pillow he'd ever laid his head on and the feeling of soft fingers running through his curly hair. The latter feeling imminently had Izuku snapping his eyes open to see what was going on only to be staring directly into Yanagi's blue eyes. The strange part was she was upside down from Izuku's perspective. Ah, you have awakened, spoke Yanagi with a small smile as she looks into his eyes. Yeah, you're awake, Izu. I was worried when you fainted, commented Pony, who popped into his field of view. Izuku rapidly realized that he was being given a lap pillow on his bed by Yanagi. Before Izuku could freak out or faint again, Yanagi rested one of her hands on his cheek. Please remain calm and attempt not to faint again, we wish to discuss much with you. Spoke Yanagi. Her tone along with the calming effect she had on Izuku kept the green-haired teen from fainting again. But it did not stop his face from gaining a massive blush for not only his position, but also remembering what caused him to faint in the first place. Oh, okay, I'll try, but can I sit up, please? Asked Izuku after a moment and a slightly disappointed look on her face, Yanagi nodded in acceptance, allowing Izuku to sit up and move a bit away from the two girls. The three teens sat in awkward silence for several moments as Izuku thought about how to proceed. So D, did you to mean what you said? Asked Izuku quietly glancing between the two girls. Yes, I meant what I said, I'll like you a lot, replied Pony twiddling her fingers with a blush on her face. I was genuine in my statement, I fancy you quite a lot, respond Yanagi her tone laced with affection. And you both want to de-date me, at the same time, questioned Izuku, having a hard time believing that this situation was really happening. That is correct, we discussed this at length, and agreed that we both wish to pursue a romantic relationship with you. Thus are simultaneous confessions. Answer Yanagi. Izuku looked down and away from the girls as he was having a hard believing that one girl would want to date him, let alone two. But why me? You two are so amazing and beautiful and I'm just a Deku. What could you possibly see in me that was worth dating, let alone sharing? Questioned Izuku. Pony gently took one of his hands in her own and gave it a squeeze making Izuku look her in the eyes. Izu, there's a lot of reasons why I like you. You jumped in to save me during the entrance exam, even though your quirk hadn't manifested. You helped me with my Japanese, you are sweet and kind, yet strong and determined. I find it cute how you get all shy when I hug you, or when you start to mutter, and of course I find you hot especially with your muscles. Spoke Pony with affection and honesty clear in her voice. Izuku blushed and struggled to find a response, but Riaiko began to speak before he could even stutter. I find many of your traits desirable, you are brave, polite, empathetic, intelligent, and I also find your enthusiasm for heroes and quirks quite adorable. You are not a Deku do not believe any of that drivel which comes from that brute's mouth. Added Riaiko, gently placing her hand atop his free one. Izuku glanced between the two girls unable to find any deceit in their words. He felt another squeeze from Pony. Izu? That's the word that the mean explosion man used. What does Deku mean? asked Pony in a gentle tone, clearly understanding it as some form of insult but wanting clarification. Izuku hesitated to answer, but it didn't matter as Yanagi responded before Izuku could muster the courage. 
It is an alternate way of reading his name, it basically means useless person. Explained Yanagi, not using her normal verbose way of speaking. The horse girl only needed a moment to process her friend's explanation. The American quickly pulled Izuku into a strong hug. The boy's nose was assaulted by the scent of Pony's cinnamon soap. Oh, Izu, you are not useless, don't listen to that asshole, exclaimed Pony in English, not caring that she basically was pressing the boy's head right into her bust. Yanagi also joined the hug, whispering comforting words into Izuku's ear. The three students in their emotional state had forgotten that Izuku had a neighbor, and that they would be able to hear the loud conversion they were having. They really do care thought Izuku finally convinced. The green-haired boy returned the hug with the girls. The hug lasted several moments and warmed Izuku's chest. Izuku, I do not wish to place undue pressure on you. But if possible may we have a reply to our confession, spoke Yanagi breaking the quiet moment and the group hug. I, I've never had a girlfriend before, let alone two, so I am inexperienced with relationships. But I'll try my hardest to make you both happy, I accept your feelings spoke Izuku with conviction in his voice and a smilier look to his hero mode on his face. Yeah, he said yes, yelled Pony in English practically vibrating with joy. I'll be in your care, whispered Yanagi to Izuku grabbing his hand and interlaced her fingers with his, after which she gave him a peck on the cheek causing him to blush. Izu, Riaiko, let's go on a date tomorrow, spoke Pony excitedly as she took hold of Izuku's free arm. Oh, okay, Pony, did you have something in mind? asked Izuku. Pony thought over their options before replying. Well, what about a picnic tomorrow? I found a really nice spot along the path I run for training. We could also watch some movies in the afternoon and cuddle. Plus, I thought it would be best to stay on campus, proposed Pony, looking for the opinions of her companions. That sounds like a great idea, Pony, responded Izuku. This is going to be my first date, thought Izuku equal part excited and anxious. I agree with this proposal. I can prepare the food. Spoke Yanagi, already playing out what she would make. Are you sure, Yanagi? I can help with the food. Asked Izuku, only for Yanagi to shake her head in the negative. Please you may refer to me by my first name as you do with Pony. I am sure I require no assistance, I wish to show off my domestic skill in the creation of delicious cuisine in order to impress you. Spoke Riaiko bluntly as she looked straight at him. Oh, okay, Riaiko, I'll leave it to you. Responded Izuku blushing a bit for using her first name and her words. Oh, I can't wait for our first date, gushed Pony giggling in excitement. Zetsuna quietly moved her disembodied ear away from the wall between her and Izuku's room. A hurricane of emotions and thoughts swirled in her mind. She was not certain how to react to the information she had just heard. Setsuna leaned back in her desk chair hand over her face in thought. So Izuku is relationship. Good, it should help him with his confidence. Thought Setsuna genuinely hoping it would boost the nervous boy's self-esteem and confidence but her heart also tightened a bit. But where does that leave me and why do I feel jealous of them? Can I date him too? The girls are both dating him at the same time, so maybe, do I even want to join or share for the matter? Would they even let me join in if I asked? And what if they say no they don't want to share with anyone else? Would they want me to stop teasing Izuku? Are they going to hide the relationship or be open and blunt about it? thought Satsuna, her forehead hitting her desk in frustration. Satsuna thought of herself as quick-thinking and decisive, but she was currently drawing a blank on all fronts, leaving her with only one option left, she needed advice. She immediately eliminates talking to her most of her classmates. She could ask Kendo, nothing builds trust like being through a life-and-death situation together. But Satsuna didn't want to spill the beans about this to a classmate in case Izuku, Riaiko, and Pony planned to keep their relationship low-key. Plus, she suspected Kendo of also having something for the shy boy. So this left her with a single option, she pulled out her phone and dialed. The phone only rang twice before it was picked up. Hello, sweetie. How's my little kaiju doing? Spoke a women's voice in a kind tone. Hi, mom. 
Listen, I need some advice, spoke Setsuna in a tone that coveted her troubled mind. Sure, I'm all ears, responded Setsuna's mother, her tone reassuring. Wednesday, 10.30 a.m. Izuku was a nervous wreck from the moment he woke up. He had hoped his early morning workout would have helped. But even after he had finished, his nerves were still wound tight like a spring. He took a much longer shower than normal trying to calm himself down. Currently, Izuku stood in his room trying to figure out what he should wear. This was his first date ever, and he had no experience in what to do. He considered calling his mother to ask her. But he knew she would either faint if he told her he was going on a date or ask a lot of questions that he wasn't ready to answer. So Izuku gave a call to the only other adult he thought could give him good advice in this situation, because they no doubt had ample experience with dates. Hello young Midoira, how are you? Questioned All Might secretly thanking his student for interrupting Gran Trino's lecture. I, I'm doing all right. But I need some advice about something if that's okay, asked Izuku nervously. Of course it's okay. What kind of advice? Responded All Might eager to make up for his poor performance as a mentor up to this point. Well, hypothetical speaking, what should one wear on a date? Asked Izuku much like a son would ask his father. I wasn't expecting that. I thought he'd have a question about one for all. I haven't been on a date in years thought All Might surprised at the question, and also easily seeing through Izuku's hypothetical excuse. All Might was determined to give the best advice he could. I need a little more information, young Midoriyara. What will this hypothetical date be? asked All Might playing along with the boy's thin facade. It's a picnic on a path on campus, answered Izuku thinking that his lie worked. In that case, I'd say something more causal, long pants, jeans or something along those lines with a color button-up shirt, a flannel shirt would also work well. I'd also roll up the sleeves or wear one with short shelves to show off your arms a little. You've worked hard on your physique so take some pride in it. Spoke All Might slipping into Big Might near the end of his advice. Okay got it. Thank you so much All Might I appreciate it, I hope the girls like it. Spoke Izuku quickly as he quickly started looking for what clothes match his mentor's advice, not realizing his slip. Anytime, young Midoriya, I wish you luck with your hypothetical, but I must go now. Spoke All Might with a chuckle at the kid's enthusiasm. Okay, bye All Might, responded Izuku before he hung up. All Might chuckled at the boy's antics before picking up on an important detail. Wait, did he say girls? thought All Might only for his train of thought to be violently derailed when he received a kick to the face. Enough with the phone, I'm not done beating some sense into you yet, yelled Gran Torino as he landed on top of All Might's coffee table breaking it in half. With Izuku a few minutes later, Izuku felt much better in the black and green flannel shirt and blue jeans as he made his way down to the common room. He even did as his mentor advised and rolled up the shelves to show more of his arms, and it only made him a little self-conscious. Once he entered the kitchen, he quickly spotted several sandwiches, utensils, fresh fruit and serval side dishes floating into a large basket. He could see Riaiko standing at the counter wearing a black sweater and grey jeans that hugged her legs. Izuku froze in place a large blush on his face as his new girlfriend subtly hummed a song to herself, her body moving to the beat of a song Izuku could barely remember hearing before. Her movements were causing Izuku to focus his full attention on her butt as it moved in an almost hypnotic way. The moment broke when Riaiko started to turn around. Izuku quickly snapped his gaze to her face, hoping she didn't catch him looking. However, a small, subtle smirk graced her lips when she met his gaze dashing his hopes. But she didn't seem anger quite the opposite, in fact. Greetings, Izuku, I must say find your current appearance to be quite handsome. Greeted Riaiko as she used her quirk to move the last of the food into the basket. Hey, R. Riaiko, thanks, you look just, wow. Spoke Izuku scratching the back of his neck in nervousness. A light dusting of red appeared on the gray-haired girl's cheeks as she closed the top of the basket and placed a picnic blanket on top. I am elated that my current appearance has left you at a loss for words. 
I am also quite pleased that I garnered such intense focus from you, spoke Yanagi with a knowing smile as she approached him. The boy smiled back with a blush on his face as Riaiko gave him a quick hug. I have finished with the food, Pony's parents called her a short while ago. We will set off for our romantic rendezvous upon her return. Continued Riaiko. Izuku could tell that Riaiko was excited by the way her hands moved around. The sound of hooves on wood made Izuku turn around just in time for Pony to jump into his arms. Izu, are you ready for our date? I could barely sleep I was so excited, spoke Pony as wrapped her arms around his neck. Yes, I am Pony, answered Izuku as Pony let go of him and back away, and for the second time today, Izuku's mind became completely focused on the sight before him. Well, what do you think? asked Pony doing a quick spin to show off the blue sundress she was wearing. It went all the way down past her knees. A large sun hat on her head had holes for her horns. Her hair was pulled back placing her horse-like ears on full display. Why you look really see cute, responded Izuku his face red from embarrassment. But it was totally worth the radiant smile Pony gave him for his words. Thanks, Izu, responded Pony with a cute giggle. I believe that we should depart for our romantic outing. Pony, would you kindly lead the way? Spoke Riaiko picking up the full basket. Sure, let's go. It's not too far, respond Pony happily leading them out of the house and onto the nearby running trail leading into the wooded area of campus. The trail was well maintained and large enough for four people to run side by side. Vanagi linked one of her arms with Izuku's as they walked, basket in her other arm. Pony was skipping down the trail visibly elated. Yanagi could see that Izuku was still nervous but she was happy to see he was calming down and getting more comfortable. A content sigh slipped past her lips as a gentle breeze rustled the trees and a chorus of birds sang. Izuku took a deep breath enjoying the fresh forest air as the trail curved to the left. Pony who was leading the way looked over her shoulder at them. We are here, stated Pony before she vanished from their line of sight in the curve's bend. Izuku and Riaiko picked up the pace to catch up to Pony. The trail itself continued in a straight line for a while before it curved to the left again. However, to the right of the trail was a clearing, the grass was cut short, and the clearing bordered a pond. The clearing had several picnic tables dotted around and even some spots for barbecuing. This location is lovely, it is a great site for our meal commented Riaiko as she detached herself from Izuku and began to set up one of the tables for their meal. Thanks, I thought it'd be a good spot. I like to run this trial for my morning jog. Spoke Pony happily. Pony, I also have a morning workout W would you like to? Started Izuku nervous and unsure if he was overstepping, but was interrupted when Pony spoke up. I'd love to go on morning runs together, just be sure to keep up spoke Pony, a small competitive fire in her eyes that reminded Izuku of the endurance run of the assessment test. I, I should be saying that to you, replied Izuku who despite the stutter had his own competitive fire. I do believe that can wait. Let us eat, interrupted Riaiko from the table where the food was spread ready to eat. Izuku and Pony did not need any more prompting as they both sat down and with a quick thanks to Riaiko for making the food the three students dug in. You, um, would it be okay if we got to know each other a little better? But only if you guys want. Proposed Izuku after several minutes of at least for him awkward silence. That's a great idea. But where should we start? Asked Pony in between bites of her sandwich. How about hobbies? or maybe a little about where we grew up," spoke Izuku proposing a starting point. For instance, I grew up here in Musitafu just me and my mom. I enjoy everything revolving around heroes and I like video games," spoke Izuku starting off the topic. Pony immediately jumped in once he concluded. Well you know I'm from the US, but more specifically I am from Texas. My family has this big ranch that we live and work on. It's pretty big, which is nice cause besides my mom and dad, I have two sisters and three brothers. My older sister is even a hero. I'm a big fan of action movies, comic books, and anime. 
spoke Pony enthusiastically, accidentally slipping back into English. It sounds like your home can become quite chaotic with so many siblings. Comment Riaiko as she poured herself some tea from a thermos. Yeah, it does especially when my brothers get rowdy or start a prank war. But I love my family there, the ones that pushed me to try for you, uh. Spoke Pony as she did her best not to mess up any of the words. Why you, uh, though? America has some of the best hero schools in the world. Asked Izuku curious. Pony blushed, a little embarrassed. Well, when I was little, I was taken hostage during a bank robbery. But before I knew it All Might showed up and saved me, this was back when he was a new hero and traveling all over the states. It inspired me to be a hero and ever since then I've wanted to go to the same hero school he went to. Explained Pony a little embarrassed by her reasoning. That makes sense. I've wanted to be a hero ever since I understood what they were. Living so close to Yua, I always dreamed of attending here where so many great heroes were taught. Admitted Izuku before he and Pony looked at Riaiko. I dwell in Thyphora City's back to ward, my parents both work at the hospital there. They have been utilizing their quirks to help people since before I was born and I wish to do similar. But I desired to prevent people from getting injured in the first place. So I began training to be a hero. As for activities I enjoy partaking in, I am quite fond of computer strategy games, as well as the supernatural and horror genres in general games, novels, movies, and shows I find them all enjoyable. I even used to babysit to gather funds to fuel these interests, spoke Riaiko eloquently informing the two more about herself. I don't really know or watch horror movies. Do you have any favorites? asked Pony. The look Riaiko gave was a little frightening as she began to detail some of her favorite horror movies. The conversation flowed naturally from there, jumping from movies to heroes to quirks to games. The three teens happily ate all of the food. By the time they had finished the food, noon had already come and gone. Pony and Izuku both cleaned off the table and placed the blanket and tableware back into the basket. Pony, I do believe it is your turn to walk with Izuku as we agreed, commented Riaiko as she grabbed the basket. Yeah, replied Pony with a cheer. She happily latched onto her boyfriend's arm. The feeling of Pony's breasts on his arm made Izuku's face burst into a bright red blush. Riaiko made a sound that might have been mistaken for a quiet giggle. But Izuku could not be sure as his brain was having difficulty forming coherent thoughts. Riaiko began to walk back toward the dorms, and Pony was able to get Izuku walking as they fell in step behind the ghostly girl. Izuku was having a hard time focusing between Pony's body press against his side and Riaiko's swaying hips in front of him. Within the spaghetti of thoughts in his head, two things became clear to Izuku. One he was astonished that he hadn't fainted yet, and two his girlfriends may give him a heart attack one day. In an effort to distract himself, he turned his gaze to Pony and asked a question that has been on his mind since school started. Um, Pony, I wanted to ask you something. Spoke Izuku, the horse girl looked at him waiting for him to ask his question. Why do you hide your ears with your hair? Asked Izuku tentative. The smile on Pony's face dropped at the question and she stopped walking. Pony, are you okay? I'm sorry for asking. You don't have to answer. Question Izuku in concern, slight panic, and a little guilt for causing this state. Riaiko also stopped and approached. No, it's okay. I was bullied in my old middle school. There weren't a lot of people with mutant quirks like mine. So I was picked on. They made fun of the way I look, saying I was a cow. Spoke Pony, her hand clutching her dress. Izuku recalled how Pony was crying after Bakugo called her cowdits in the cafeteria the other day. A feeling bubbled in Izuku's chest at the thought. But before he could dwell on the feeling Pony continued. They liked to pull on my ears and call them ugly. One day they even. Spoke Pony who instead of continuing quietly approached Izuku and gestured to one of her ears. Izuku moved in for a closer look and he noticed a faint patch of scar tissue in a circular pattern near the end of her ear. It didn't take Izuku long to put the pieces together. Izuku swore he felt some of his own scars throb with phantom pain. He imminently felt a sense of kinship with Pony 
understanding what she might have through. Well, I think your ears are really cute. I find everything about you cute, spoke Izuku in a sincere tone. In a rare moment of assertiveness, he took a gentle hold of her ear and gave it a soft kiss. His action causes Pony to let out a small eep in surprise and a blush at his display of affection. Izuku followed that up by pulling her into a hug. It took a few moments for Pony to process what just happened, but when she did she returned the hug. Thanks, Izu. I should be over it by now, especially after my brothers beat them up and my folks talked to the school. But it still hurts, you know, spoke Pony tightening the hug. Riaiko patted Pony's back in silent support. Yeah, I know. Come on, Pony, let's head back to the dorms. We can watch more of that pirate anime or anything else you want. Proposed Izuku taking Pony's hand as he broke the hug. Riaiko took note of Izuku's words. The evidence that he was bullied keeps accruing. I should mention this to the others later, and I should bring Pony into the situation, thought Riaiko. Can we cuddle while we watch? asked Pony, staring at Izuku with her big eyes. Sure, responded Izuku, using the last of this burst of confidence to grab Riaiko's free hand with his own. With a simple tug, the three teens walked hand in hand back to the dorms. However, upon returning to the dorms they found Hound Dog waiting for them. He needed to speak to Izuku in his office, so with a promise that he'd be back soon. Izuku followed his teacher into the main building. Iwa Main Building Hound Dog's Office 1.34 p.m. Izuku sat across from Hound Dog, his body sinking into the overly plush chair. The pro hero offered Izuku some mints from a bowel on his desk, but Izuku politely declined. What did you want to talk about, Sensei? asked Izuku, twiddling his fingers. Hound Dog pulled out a photo from one of his desk's drawers and pushed the photo forward for Izuku to see. The photo was one taken at a distance and clearly from someone trying to stay hidden. Izuku immediately recognized the villainess he encountered during the Ust attack. Lolt? Spoke Izuku the name slipping out. Yes, some of your classmates were concerned that this villainess may have done something to you during the Usui attack. Do you want to talk about it? Asked Hound Dog with concern. But be well, why you see, um, about that? Spoke Izuku nervous and stuttering over his words. Midoriya, I know she was after you. Can you tell me what for? Asked Hound Dog gently. Izuku was quiet for a full five minutes before he replied. She she wanted to take me with her, I think she said something along the lines of I was her type. She um felt me up all over like everywhere. Explained Izuku his voice quiet and his eyes were firmly looking down at his own hands. I see, replied Hound Dog quietly wrote on a notepad. How did that make you feel? asked Hound Dog looking at Izuku whose eyes were still glued to his own hands. If I'm being honest I kind of liked the contact itself, and her age didn't bother me nearly as much as I think it should. What affected me most was the fact she was a villain. It made my skin crawl and made me feel a little dirty. If if it was some else, spoke Izuku blushing as the images of some of his female classmates, especially his new girlfriends replacing the villainesses flashed through his mind. But his mind settled on the image of a certain rabbit heroine in the villainess's place. I, I wouldn't have really minded at worst I'd be embarrassed or faint, spoke Izuku honestly. His face was a bright fire engine red. HM, any particular reason you think that's the case? questioned Hound Dog trying to keep the boy talking as he continued scribbling more on his notepad. W well, I never really had a lot of contact with girls aside from my mother. I wasn't really popular in school. I only recently held a girl's hand for the first time. Admitted Izuku his tone filled with shame and embarrassment. HM sounds like he is touch starved along with self-worth issues. Thought Hound Dog underlined several of the notes he had written didn't want to press more to avoid the boy clamming up so he would shift the topic slightly and circle back. All right let's move on to the us event as a whole. Spoke Hound Dog as he continued asking questions to the pro hero in training. Hound Dog wanted to give Izuku a full evaluation and see if he couldn't convince the boy to meet with him regularly. Meanwhile, Satsuna's room class 1B dorms. 
pony was confused why Yanagi brought her to Satsuna's dinosaur-covered room instead of preparing to hang out and cuddle with their boyfriend. Pony's confusion only grew when an equally confused Kami was already in the room along with Satsuna, who was missing an eye and an ear. So, what's the sitch? Are we gonna have some girl talk? Are we ranking the boys? I'm game. Asked Kami lightheartedly in an attempt to break the awkwardness. We'll have to save the girl talk for another time. Commented Satsuna as she started a video call, Kendo answered the call. We wish to discuss a more serious matter. Committed Yanagi as she took a seat on a Jurassic Park beanbag. What is it? Asked Pony taking a seat beside her fellow American. It's about the class rabbit. Commented Satsuna. It was a testament to Izuku's first impression that everyone immediately knew who Satsuna was referring to. Let me take it from here, Satsuna, spoke Kendo. The redhead girl explained the situation between Izuku and Bakugo and presented what evidence they had. Kami and Pony were understandable anger. Yanagi wanting to prevent a tangent decided to speak. It is clear that we are all in agreement that this situation must be resolved. Does anyone have a proposition on how we can proceed? Asked Yanagi wanting the other's input. I say we let his ma know, maybe she can get him to open up. Proposed Pony, thinking that if they can get Izuku to talk about it, it will be easier to get his bully punished. I don't know if that would work, Izuku seems real adamant on defending that asshole for some reason, he may clam up and deny everything. Commented Setsuna not wanting Izuku to work against them. The teacher's probs have more of an idea on what to do with this. They already seem to think that the bastard is Sasa F. So I think we should drop them our info. Commented Kami thinking the teachers would know what to do. If possible, I'd want to confront Bakugo and see if he'll spill the beans. Proposed Kendo internally just wanting a more direct approach to solving this issue. Given how arrogant he is, I wouldn't be surprised if he brags about it. Might be smart to record him when we do it. Added Setsuna liking the idea. I believe pursuing all these options is viable. However, I believe informing his mother should be a priority. I think she would react better if we deliver the news, since she is aware we are close to Izuku. She can conclude even from our short meeting that we are Izuku's friends and therefore care about him. Spoke Yanagi giving her opinion on the matter. Pony was in full agreement with Yanagi and after mulling it over the others agreed as well. Okay, so we'll tell her. But how do we do that? None of us have her number right? Do we wait for parents' day? Questioned Setsuna. Riaiko already had an idea on how to resolve this issue. I should have gotten Mamadurea's number thought Kami lamenting the missed opportunity. I can acquire her number from Izuku, from there I'll get her address so we can speak with her in person. Spoke Yanagi bluntly. How are you going to get him to give you her number? Spoke Kendo with curiosity in her tone. I simply plan to directly ask Izuku for her number under the pretext of wishing to speak with her about some of her recipes. From there securing an invitation to her home should be as simple as asking for in-person instruction. Spoke Yanagi explaining her plan. That's really clever, let us know when you have the number, but she may invite you after parents' day, so we might need to hold off before we tell the teachers. Spoke Setsuna, knowing that Yanagi had some other motives. All right, Riaiko's gonna get Mamadoria's digits. So then who is going to talk to Short Fuse? Asked Kami looking at the other girls. I'll talk to him, Setsuna can you come too so you can record him? Spoke Kendo looking at the dinosaur loving girl. Sure, I got your back, let's get the jackass to squeal. Answered Setsuna with a smile that showed off her sharp teeth. After we have his ma and the teachers on board, we can talk to Izu together. Spoke Pony happy that a plan to help Izuku had been decided on. Agreed, so Yanagi will get the number. Set and I will try confronting Bakugo after class tomorrow, Pony. Kami, can you two keep Izuku busy? I don't want him noticing what we're up to. We'll talk to the teachers after that. Spoke Kendo recapping the plan. No prob, we'll ask him to help us with some quirk training. He'll tots jump at that. Commented Kami. We should talk to All Might first, he's Izu's favorite. 
If he helps, Izu might open up easier. Added Pony recalling the boy's collection of merchandise. Smart his room's basically a shrine to heroes, especially All Might. Commented Setsuna agreeing with Pony. If all goes well, we may resolve this before the festival begins or after its completion. Spoke Yanagi, her tone flat. Setsuna suddenly stood up in alarm, causing her classmates to look at her funny. Looks like we'll have to cut off the meeting here the rabbits at the front door. Spoke Setsuna as she opened her bedroom window. We'll take more tomorrow, bye girls. Spoke Kendo ending the call. Setsuna's disembodied eye and ear floated in through the now open window. The body parts returned to their proper places on Setsuna's head as she closed the window once more. Kami, Pony, and Yanagi slipped out of Setsuna's room. Yanagi and Pony would be lined downstairs to go to greet Izuku. They immediately picked up on how emotionally drained he was. It was no mystery to them that it had to do with whatever he discussed with Hound Dog. So they proceeded to bring their boyfriend into his room where they watched anime, cuddled, and did their best to cheer him up. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Alpha of Rapture for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku 2 if for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.